Uh, if you have ever had the pleasure of texting your parents before they knew what emojis were, uh, then you probably had to explain them to them before, and, and they, they didn't realize what you were trying to say, uh, and so you had to sit there and say, well, this means this, this means this, this is what this means. Uh, but I think a lot of times parents forget that before uh, we were texting, uh, before we were sending emojis, uh, we were using emojis ourselves in, in handwritten form. Uh, I, I've talked before about how we used to pass notes, like handwritten notes on our boyfriends and girlfriends back in the day. And uh, at, at the bottom of those notes, a lot of times, uh, instead of writing out the words, I love you, we would do the same thing you guys do uh, in, in text. In text, we would say, I heart you. And that's how we would sign off on, 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 on our notes. Or, or sometimes we would say, I L Y. I L Y S M. You know, I love you. I love you so much. And we would use those shorthands. We would use those acronyms as a way to, to shorten what we, were, what we were trying to tell them that we love them. And so uh, don't let your parents say they've never shortened words like that before. They have. Uh, if they were really artsy, they would draw an eyeball and then a heart. And then maybe like a little uh, sheep. A female sheep is called a what? A U. E U. E W E W E, yeah. So if they, they really are here, they eyeball, heart, sheep, I love you. Uh, and so we, we've used those shortened terms uh, for a long time. And, and sometimes it might, uh, we might say, hey, I'm using this just so I can get it out, out real quick and finish my note and send it on or whatever. But uh, really it was just a way to, uh, to kind of appease our boyfriend or girlfriend. They wanted to hear us say it, and we weren't really comfortable with saying it, and so we would right, I heart you or I L Y, and hopefully we would, they would be happy with that. Uh, even in, when I was in high school, I, I, uh, when I was dating, I, I, even though I was young, I knew that the words I love you were very significant words. I knew that there was uh, an expectation that came with those words. I knew that there was uh, importance and depth and significance that came with those words. And so I was always really, really cautious about saying that. And so when I was in high school, it, 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 when I signed a note, when I wrote a note, I would say, uh, I heart you or I L-Y, rather than actually writing out the words, I love you. And I never said those words. The words never came out of my mouth uh, when I was in high school. I just, I, I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure those words carried weight and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to risk it. Now fast forward to 2008. 2008 is uh, when Julie and I started dating. We were, we were both 27 years old when we started dating. <clears throat> and uh, about April that year, she had just, she just turned 20, 28. She's older than me if you guys didn't know that. By three months. But still. Um, so uh, it was April of 2008. We've been dating for a few months. And, and at this point in our lives, when you're, when you're 27, 28, you've had some, you've had some bad dates. You've had some bad relationships, and so you know what to look, for, look out for. There are red flags to look out for. And so she and I had both been looking out for these red flags, and we weren't finding any. Or we weren't finding really significant ones, I guess. And, and, and we're like, hey, you know, maybe this thing is going to go the distance. This, this, this thing could have legs. This could, this could work out. And, and then I started getting those, those butterfly feelings I talked about last week. You get these butterfly feelings like, no, I, I, I can't say those words. That's, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I don't know if she's going to say it back. I'm not going to risk it. I'm not going to go out on the limb and say those words without knowing she's going to say it back. I'd had my heart broken before, so I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to just throw it out there without knowing for sure that they were going to come back to me. But April 2008, we were at a wedding in San Antonio. It was like a whole wedding weekend. We were at uh, maybe your grandparents wear S A S shoes. They're like orthotic shoes. Uh, they're actually really wealthy people at home, and they have this incredible ranch outside San Antonio. We were at a wedding at this ranch, and so we had been hiking all day and uh, hanging out with our friends, and it was just like, I was like, hey, you know, the wedding is just magical moments, you know, and there's romance in the air, and I'm like, I definitely, I definitely love this girl, and so uh, I'm going to tell her, and so I got, we got away from everybody for, for a minute, and I just, I just said, I looked at her and I said, Julie, I think I'm falling in love with you. That's what you're all supposed to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over there. So, I, like I said, I wasn't going to say that unless I knew it was going to come back to me. I was confident. It was out there. Uh, there's, there's no take backs in this moment. I put everything out there. I laid my life on the line in this moment. And, uh, and I, 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 I was confident that she was going to say it back. 
she didn't. She didn't. Instead, instead of those three little words, I heard two little words, and she's leaving now, so she can't. I can say what I want now. No. Instead of saying I love you, she said, thank you. Thank you. Now, in her defense, it was an enthusiastic thank you. You know, she appreciated it. Uh, but uh, I did not expect that. Now, a couple weeks later, I'll, I'll say this, a couple weeks later, she did, uh, she, she did let me know we were, we were at, at my apartment. Uh, my roommate was hanging out in there, and, uh, and I could tell she was, like, really antsy. And, and it was like, as soon as he left, uh, she's like, I've been waiting for him to leave this whole time to tell you this. I love you, too. And, uh, and she'll tell you, she wasn't going to say it until she knew for sure. And, uh, and so she, she stuck with it. She didn't say it until she was sure. But uh, it's a big deal to say those words, to say, I love you, to somebody else. Uh, we're in our, our second week of our, our God, Guys, and Girls series. Last week we talked about uh, how it was important for our relationship to God, with God, to come before every other relationship that we've got. Uh, this week we're going we're gonna to talk about love. We're going to focus in on, on that word. And, and my hope is that that you are able to connect to the true meaning of that four-letter L word. It's not a word that should be thrown around lightly. And in order to connect to that true meaning of that four-letter L word, we're going to contrast that with another four-letter L word. Those of you who are in our small groups, you've been doing the 28-day devotional, trying to figure out what God has to say in the Bible about love. And the Bible has a lot to say about love. There's, uh, there's a lot of passages that talks about love, but there's two really important ones. There's one in 1 John and there's one in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to look at two of those passages tonight uh, to start out with and just dig into what the Bible has to say about love. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. That's where we're going to start out tonight. 1 John uh, chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. John says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. You've got to understand, the guy who wrote this, the guy who wrote this is John the disciple. Uh, he wrote the Gospel of John. If you read through the Gospel of John, uh, he'll tell you that he was Jesus' favorite disciple. <clears throat> so he knows Jesus, he knows God, he is familiar with them, and he understands it, and he, he says love is such a big deal to God that God is love. Love is such a big deal to God that he says that God is love. And so if we really want to know love, then we have to know God. The second big section of scripture, like I said, is in 1 Corinthians 13. If you've been to a wedding, they will read this, they'll read part of this chapter. This is called the love chapter. And Paul writes really poetically about love. Uh, let's look at verses 4 through 7. It says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. There's a couple of things that really stick out to me from this, this passage about love. The first is that love takes work. Love takes work. Expressing and staying true to all those attributes in that passage are a pretty tall order. However, it's pretty awesome, awesome to consider that Jesus expressed these qualities all the time and continues to express these qualities all the time. The other thing that sticks out to me about this passage is that phrase in the middle of verse 5. It says, it does not insist on its own way. Other translations say that love is not self-seeking. Love isn't about what we get out of it. Love is selfless, which seems so counter to the definition of love that we see depicted in our current culture. The word gets tossed around a lot. You think about it, one, in, in one moment, uh, one breath, a woman can say, I love my husband, and then in the next breath, she can say, I love tacos. You know, like if, if she's on a date with her husband at Taco Bell, both of those things can come out of her mouth. Well, actually, both of those things can come out of your mouth at any given time. 
Because, like, I love my wife, I also love tacos. I'd be willing to talk to you about both of those things at any time of day. We, we, we throw that word love out there a lot. But when we say I love a person, when we talk about I love food, we have different, uh, different, uh, different levels of, of seriousness applied to the word love in those, in those phrases. We're not attaching the same weight and meaning to both of those loves. <laughs> At the same time, we limit the definition of love to just a feeling. Part of our smaller group questions on Sunday was, do you consider love a feeling, a choice, or an action? And a lot of times we get, we get caught up thinking that love is, is a feeling. I, I believe that that's part of it. Part of love is a feeling, but there, it is also an action. It's also a choice. <clears throat> I remember last year we talked about our feelings and how difficult they are to trust. In the morning, you can pick out an outfit, you can feel good about that outfit, but by the time you get to school, you might feel completely different about that outfit. You might wake up having a, having a good hair day, uh, by the time you get to school, by the end of the day, you feel differently about your hair. Uh, you, you, might, uh, you might feel good about a number that you picked for your team, the number that you're going to wear for your team, but after... Uh, after going over 10 in the first couple games, you hate that number now. Our feelings can go up and down. Our feelings can go sideways. Our feelings can go every which way. We can't trust our feelings. Now, love starts with a feeling, but it's always accompanied by choosing selfless action. Love starts out as a feeling, but it's always accompanied, accompanied by choosing selfless action action, when we limit, limit love to a feeling, we sell it short. And I think that we can also call certain attitudes uh, and, and actions love that really aren't love at all. Sometimes we're really in like with someone and we're so emotionally charged in the freshness of this relationship that we call it love. And then there are times when love is nothing more than a selfish desire to get something that we want. And so we throw that love word around to try to manipulate somebody into giving us something that we want. It's in these moments where we're mixing up love with another four-letter L word. The word's lust. Now for many of us, when we say the word lust, we immediately jump to looking at, at sexually explicit videos or pictures, pornography. Although that definitely plays into that action, there's much more lust that's valuable for us to understand. <laughs> Lust is something that takes place in our thoughts and our minds. And here's a few things that the Bible teaches us about lust. Number one, lust is about things. Lust is about things. True love is always directed towards people. When we love things, we're really lusting. When we lust over a person, it's because we have turned that person into an object or a thing in order to get what we want. Lust is a feeling. The Bible often talks about fleshly desires, and you, you, you'll hear that if you study the New Testament, you'll hear the word fleshly desires. Fleshly desires are basically our desires void of God. When we limit love to just a feeling without selfless actions, it turns into lust. Lust is selfish. It's focused on personal gain and satisfaction. What can I get out of this? How can I feel the best? This may be the biggest place where we can see a difference between Love and lust. In fact, if, if I could sum up those two words in one simple statement, I would say lust is selfish and love is selfless. Lust is selfish and love is selfless. In that simple statement, you see this drastic difference between these words that look very similar. We can get these two mixed up if we're not careful. And when we're driven by lust instead of love, it can have some really nasty effects on us. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about those who are, who are dominated by lust. He says this, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous. They have given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. 
we read this passage, there's, there's things that we can see, uh, ways that we can see how lustful living affects us. Number one, it, it darkens our understanding. It darkens our understanding. It, it, we lose sensitivity. It calls us ignorant. We have hard hearts. We become callous. We lose that sensitivity. And it leaves us wanting more. It leaves us wanting more. It says they've given themselves up. Sensuality. They, they don't even fight it anymore. They just want more and more and more of it. And if, if we're not careful, lust ends up controlling us. As we, as we dig into this, this word, we've got to be aware of the elephant in the room. The, the phrase elephant in the room, it's, it, 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 it's meant to talk about a, an uncomfortable presence of something that, that everybody's trying to ignore. Like if there's an elephant in this room and everybody was aware that it was there, but nobody wanted to talk about it. And so when we talk about lust, the elephant in the room is, uh, is pornography. And we're going to talk about that. I want you to start, I want to start out by showing this video real quick. Just watch this for a couple minutes. Research is telling us now that, that pornography changes your brain. Like it really does release uh, dopamine, the chemicals that are released whenever you do hard drugs. And it makes your brain want more and more and more of it. And those of you who, who've never dealt with addiction, uh, let me just tell you this. When you're addicted to something, whatever you have to do to get that thing is going to seem perfectly normal in that moment. And so that's what happens with, 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 with drug addicts. That's why you see drug addicts. Uh, in, in, in the streets and doing things that they would never think about doing when they were sober it's because that makes perfect sense in that moment. And so a pornography addiction works the same way. It's why, uh, it, it's why people are on their phones all the time just trying to get that next fix. It's why, it's why people stay up late at night when nobody else is up so they can see whatever they want to see. It's why we don't look at that stuff out, uh, out, out in the, the living room with everybody else around us. We go into hiding. We want to get that next fix because there's an addiction to it. And there's a dark side to pornography as well. What happens to the, the, the people that are in the videos? What happens to the people that are in the pictures? There's a whole slavery economy behind all of it. 
We can go into that at another time if, if we need to, but the danger of pornography is extremely real. And, and, and the bad part is that's turning, uh, it's turning into our sex education. It's turning into your generation's sex education. And so if, if you view pornography, you think that that's what sex is going to be like. You think that that's what is expected. Uh, girls, if you date guys who are addicted to pornography, they're going to make demands of you because that's what they see in videos. That's what they see in pictures. And Let me say this. If you're dating a guy that's addicted to pornography, just walk away. Just walk away from it. Guys, if you're addicted to pornography, I hope she walks away from you. I hope that you're single for a long time until you get that fixed. Because that does real damage. And girls, you don't have to expect to act like the girls that, you, that the guys see in the videos and pictures. You don't... You don't, you don't, don't be expected to, to do those things. Because you were made for incredibly more than that. And this can be incredibly awkward to talk about. And there's something that associated with this struggle that, that brings about shame. And I don't want to camp out in, in the shame area. Shame, shame turns us inward. Shame uh, makes us think that, hey, this is who I am. This is who I'm always going to be. I'm never going to change. And it makes us turn inward and not tell anybody about it and just say, hey, this is who I am. I'm not going to, I can't change that about me. I want this to, instead of shame, I want to, to turn us towards conviction. Conviction turns us outward and it says, I'm involved in something that's not good for me and I want to change that. Conviction turns us outward and, and, and uh, it pushes us out to, to find help. I also don't want you to, at a point where you feel stuck with no hope to get out of the place that you're stuck in. There may be some of you that say, no, no matter how hard you try, you can't stop looking. You can't stop viewing pornography. And that, that makes sense, because remember what the video said, like, it changes your brain. It changes your brain. But just like a drug addict can overcome his addiction, you can find freedom as well. So I want to give you some steps as we close tonight, some steps. If this is something that you're struggling with, uh, some steps that you can, you can use to walk through this, uh, this struggle and come out. Uh, in, 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 a, uh, in a pattern of redemption and recovery. The first step is to come clean. The first step is to come clean to God. To have a conversation with God and admit that this is something you struggle with. He already knows, but for some reason when we're addicted to something, we think that He doesn't know we can hide it. We block out the idea that He knows. And so we come clean to God first of all. The second step is to get help. You can't face this struggle alone. It's impossible to deal with it by yourself. You need accountability. And so you tell somebody else. That doesn't mean you have to get up here and tell everybody about it. Doesn't mean you have to post it anywhere and, and say tell all your followers that you're dealing with this struggle and you're trying to get away from it. But maybe you just tell, tell your small group leader. You can tell your mentor. You can tell me. You can tell some, some other adult. You can tell a, a godly friend who is further along in this process than you are to hold you accountable. I would also suggest, te suggest telling a parent. I know that makes you really uncomfortable to even think about that. I would suggest telling a parent because they're going to be with you and they're going to be able to help you set up boundaries and help you uh, become healthy. Step three is to embrace God's grace. You're not going to find victory and freedom in your own strength. It can only be found in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which, by the way, was the perfect display of selfless love. He's going to be your source of strength while you walk through this process. The fourth step is to set up boundaries. This is going to be the most difficult part of it. You need to evaluate the times and the ways you've been most susceptible to giving in to the temptation and take steps to have accountabilities in place. Maybe that means that you exchange your smartphone for a dumb phone. And that, that may freak you out, but it's better to have a dumb phone than to be addicted. It's better to, to not have the temptation at your fingertips than to have to fight it every single time you pick your phone up. Maybe there's some software that you need to get on your computer. Maybe there's some places in your house that your computer, your phone, uh, any other device you have need to go when everybody else is asleep so that you can't have access to them. You need to put boundaries in place. Some of you have heard, that, heard of the movie 100, 127 Hours. It's about a guy named Aaron Ralston. He was hiking in Utah. He didn't tell anybody where he was going. Uh, he didn't have his, uh, his phone with him, so nobody could find him. He didn't have his GPS with him. Nobody could find him. Uh, he, was, he was climbing on this rock, and, and one of the boulders fell off, and he got stuck. His arm got jammed in there. 
and, and he was stuck there for five days and five hours, 127 hours. And at one point, he, he, he had to decide how he was going to get out of that. The only way he could get out of it was to cut his arm off, and he said, it's either my arm or my life. Which one am I willing to lose? And so he snapped his arm and used a pocket knife to cut through the muscle, uh, the tendons, so that he could free himself. I mean, he's alive today because he had to make that choice, either my arm or my life. Jesus says something similar about lust in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, he says this, verses 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now Jesus is exaggerating here to make a point. But the principle is clear. The reality is that those who are dealing with a pornography struggle are likely uh, already addicted or moving towards addiction. If you're to avoid the temptation, it may, have, it, it may involve cutting off some of the items in your life for a season. Maybe it is uh, changing your phone or talking to your parents about putting some limits on your usage or... Uh, putting your devices away, whatever it is, whatever drastic steps you need to take to cure yourself of this addiction. It's that important. It's that important. See, what Jesus showed us with his death on the cross and what he wants for us, we talked last week, we're, we're built for relationships, we're designed for relationships. What he wants for us is what he's shown us, and that's selfless love. His example is what we are to be to somebody else. His example is what we're supposed to look for in a relationship. That's not lust. Lust is selfish. Lust is a desire for an object. Love is a feeling accompanied by choosing selfless acts. There's a big difference. Two words that look similar... There's a massive difference in those two. Love is selfish. Love is selfless. Lust is selfless. I'm, I'm praying that you pursue love. If, you, if, if, if I've talked about a struggle that you have tonight and you want to talk to somebody about it, I would encourage you to stick around afterwards and, and talk to me or talk to one of the other adults in here. We would love to walk with you through that and help you fix some of those things that are going on in your life. Last week, we said our relationship with God is a prayer word. This week, say love is selfless. Love is selfless. I'm excited to keep digging into this. Uh, next week, we're going to get into sex. The week, in, the week after that, we're going to get into dating. We've got a lot of fun stuff playing. Let me pray for us. Dearly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you that your word uh, addresses things that are difficult for us. Uh, God, uh, relationships are hard. Relationships are messy. Because we bring sin into it, and sometimes the sin is lust, and it causes real damage in our hearts, in our minds, and in our relationships. But God, it's a big deal to you. Relationships are a big deal to you so much so that you designed us to be in relationships, and you designed us to, to use those relationships to spread the, the gospel around the world. So God, I pray that we would get our relationships right. I pray that we would remember how important it is Love selflessly. God, that'll look so much different than everything that we see around us. And what an incredible story that we have to tell. We love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all have a great night.